Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Claire Malcolm, the Chief Executive of New Writing North, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this very special event tonight. A warm welcome both to everyone here in person at Reba in London and to everyone who's joining us tonight on the live stream of the event. New Writing North is entrusted by the John S. Cohen Foundation and our partner Arts Council England to look after this wonderful prize. It continues to be an absolute pleasure to work on such an important and uplifting project that celebrates the most important writers. Tonight, we will be announcing the winner of the David Cohn Prize for Literature, who will be the 16th recipient in the prize's glittering history. David Cohen and his family founded the John S. Cohen Foundation in 1965, and it exists to support the education, the arts, and the environment. In 1992, David created the David Cohn Prize for Literature with Arts Council England. Later, you will get to hear from David's daughter, Imogen Cohen, who now leads the foundation and the prize. The focus of the prize is on a lifetime's work, a writer with a career worth reading. It's an incredibly challenging award to judge and requires our judges to read both widely and very deeply. They did a tremendous job this year. I'm not sure if lockdown and the variations on lockdown helped or hindered, but I'd like to thank them all for their commitment and dedication to the prize. Tonight, our major prize winner will in turn offer a prize of 10,000 pounds to a younger writer in the form of the Clarissa Luard Award to help them at the start of their writing journey. New Writing North is a literary charity and the accolades that we are awarding tonight recognize that powerful creative partnerships between the charitable, private and public sector are essential for writers and for the continued development of our national culture. Together, the David Cohen Literature Prize and its sister, the Clarissa Luard Award, celebrate the very best in British writing and represent a continuum which we join together tonight to both celebrate and cherish. Thank you. Thanks. When I was asked to chair this prize, I was filled with joy and excitement, as it's quite simply one of the most prestigious and distinguished literary awards in this country. Since 1993, the prize worth 40,000 and awarded every two years has been given to an outstanding list of some of the greatest novelists, poets, playwrights, and non-fiction writers from the UK and Ireland. As you've heard, it's a prize unlike most others because instead of rewarding an author's single book, it celebrates a lifetime's achievement across all forms of literary writing. And it has the added interest and value of allowing the winner to give their own subsidiary award, named after Clarissa Luard, a fine arts administrator who I was lucky enough to know, to a writer or literary organization of their choice. The prize was the brainchild of Dr. David Cohen, a lifelong lover and patron of the arts and especially of writing. He used to call this, with a twinkle in his eye, his very own Nobel Prize, since several of the David Cohen Prize winners went on to win that other award after this one. David very sadly died in 2019, but his family has kept up a close and generous interest in the prize. In my first year as chair, I've been extremely lucky to work with four fellow judges, the broadcaster and news journalist Rita Chakrabarti, the poet Maura Dooley, the book critic Peter Kemp, and the academic Sushila Nasta, who have all been utterly committed to the task, and I think have enjoyed it as much as I have. All through lockdown, between the summer of 2020 and this autumn, they've read a huge number of books, tirelessly and enthusiastically. They've been passionate and clear-headed in their judgments, and also open to each other's views. When our meetings finally and happily switched from virtual to real, we'd become such companions in reading that we greeted each other as old friends. I love the fact that these judges were always gracious to each other, but forceful and forthright in their literary views. We discussed some grand world famous writers on our way to this choice, so there was stiff competition, but in the end we were absolutely unanimous. So now to our choice, I really dislike those award ceremonies where everyone is held in artificial suspense with an agonizing long pause before the result is announced, like in Strictly or MasterChef or the Booker Prize. 
our winner has kindly agreed to give a few short readings as part of their acceptance speech, which gives me the chance to tell you first who they are, and after that, to introduce them and their reading. So I will tell you now that the winner of this year's David Cohen Prize is Colm Tobin. Many of the writers we read for this prize do one thing, like writing novels, very well. But Colm Tobin seems to be able to do everything with equal mastery. I think of him as a kind of Renaissance man, novelist, short story writer, essayist, travel writer, critic, playwright, teacher, journalist, and activist for gay rights and abortion reform laws in Ireland. He's also published poetry, and he writes wonderfully about poets. He is very interested in music and in the creating of rhythms. His writing has a poetic depth and musical beauty to it. He is a truly international writer and an acute and watchful observer of our world, past and present, whether in Ireland or Spain, Argentina or America. He writes with daring brio and candor about homosexual desire, about thwarted and enacted erotic longings. He understands and inhabits families and the places they live in with subtlety, ferocity and tenderness. He is marvelous on mothers and sons, fathers, sons and daughters, and on the hidden feelings of children. He is a great artist of grief, elegy and yearning of exile and remembering, of the art of losing. But he is also, in other moods, a wickedly funny and witty writer, especially in his essays. Above all his other gifts, I am most moved by the drama in his fiction of the not said, of evasion and reticence, the withheld and the oblique, like a hidden tune playing under the music of the story. In over 30 years of publishing, this has always been at the heart of his work. He's talked about how the distance between what people are thinking and feeling and what they actually say can be one of the most powerful things in a novel or a story. He is a fabulous writer of dialogue, but he also writes silence with the utmost eloquence. I don't know how he does this. As in all the best art, it's a mystery. So let me fall silent and make welcome this great writer, the 2021 winner of the David Cohen Prize for Literature. Thank you. Um, I think one of the important things about this prize has become the list, the, just the list of names of people who have won the prize. And I think all of us here will have our own memories of, like mine, of when I read The Enigma of Arrival and I saw that extraordinary solitude of Bias Naipo, the way in which he noticed the world, the way in which he looked inwards as much as outwards, and the extraordinary stillness in the tone of that book. I could go on all evening really just going through the other writers. No one among these artists talked easily about painting. Some things were too important maybe, too private and personal to be freely discussed. But the only one among them I felt I could really approach was Barry Cook. I was in a gallery with him one day when his own work was showing. It was early in 1984, and standing in front of a painting, I asked Barry to remember how it emerged. How did you start it? What, what, what was the start? You make a mark, he said. That is how you start. Any mark? I asked. Maybe, but no mark is just any mark. You make the mark for a reason. It's simply that you don't know the reason when you make the mark. Do you ever discover the reason? You can see how tedious he I mean, these questions. And it, it, is, it is often not worth thinking about. You have begun the painting. I kept this in my mind as I tried to describe in the novel how my painter worked, as she followed, for example, the foresters in the Catalan Pyrenees. Quote, she followed the foresters with oil and board and a small easel, and she painted the felling of trees, the havoc. She was fascinated by the new colors of dead wood, of wounded stumps by the small clearing in the forest, breathing in freely when it could. 
She mixed colours carefully, the oily brown, fresh green, withered yellow, mingling with the flat, cold blue of the sky, the remnants of frost and snow and the beginning of spring. And later in the novel, when autumn came, she painted autumn. It was as though a fire had scorched the valley. Everything was coloured shades of red or gold or brown or rust. She needed ten colours, ten shades of rust, red, gold, yellow. And out of each shade, she needed to make ten more. Each stroke of the brush had to carry a different colour. Each stroke had to be a different size, with a different texture. Soon, it became clear that Catherine Proctor, the painter in the novel, and her companion, Michael Graves, would drift back towards Ireland, just as the painters I knew, the ones who had lived in Spain or France, did. As I thought about this, I, I wasn't concerned at all about where in Ireland they would go. It might be Dublin at the beginning and then anywhere, any, anywhere at all. It was only when I came to begin the Return to Ireland chapter that this became a problem. I was hesitating, putting the work off. I, I didn't know why. W one day, however, I decided just to do it. Just do it. Begin the chapter. No sentence would come, however. No image appeared. My characters needed to be somewhere in Ireland. I let my mind wander over places, but I was still stuck. I thought then of what Barry Cook had told me, make a mark. I wonder now, almost 40 years later, if someone had knocked on the door in that second, or if I had felt a sudden pang of hunger or a need for chocolate or something, would I, if I had come back to the page later, have made a different mark? I wrote two words. I wrote them fast without thinking I wrote the sea. And then, once more, with speed and no thought, I put in a full stop and added a grey shine on the sea. And that grey shine was the Wexford coast in Ireland. And more precisely, it was the place where a small stream cuts through the strand, the place where Keating's house used to be before the erosion took the road, and then the hill behind it, the entire hill with the lookout post, and then the house itself and all the outhouses. I was back there now in my imagination. This is where we had gone for long summers when I was growing up, but I could not see how it could hold or yield the kind of drama a novel needed. In 1993, I, I attended the inaugural presentation of the David Cohen Prize. It was held at Coots Bank. I was sure I wasn't actually invited. I mean, I just tagged along with someone who was. It was all very grand. I remember Seamus Heaney there and Carl Miller and Mary Kay Wilmers and Andrew Hagen. But I have no memory at all of V.S. Naipaul, who was presented with the prize that year. But he must have been there. Since I admired him so much, I would never have dared approach him. But I would have watched him closely and listened carefully to every word he said. It's strange that I can't remember him. I remember sometime later being foolish enough to dare approach him and foolishly saying to him that I wondered how, what he would make of Ireland if he ever wanted to write about it. And in a wonderful night Paul moment, he looked at me and said, you know, I have no interest in Ireland at all. <laughs> so I was, I was sorry, I was sorry I spoke. Um, I, remember, I remember David Cohen himself, however, he greeted all of us benignly, including those of us, I couldn't have been alone, who had crashed his party. I think he felt warmly towards the human race that day and sought to include me and many others in the fold. And having found out what I did, I had published two novels at that time, and I'm not making this up. He said, you could win this award someday, you know. I don't think either of us believed that this would happen. I certainly didn't. And so I'm surprised to be here now and I'm grateful to the judges, Hermione Lee, Maura Dooley, Sashila Nasta, Rika Chakrabarti, and Peter Kemp, uh, who took the time to read the books. I'm also really happy to be among seeing many friends, including people I recognize even with their masks on. So I'm very grateful for this, and it means a lot to me. And it's hard to imagine, because I started tentatively, and I work tentatively. I work with uncertainty. I have really no idea what the finished book is going to be like, but certainly once a book is finished, it's gone. You think about the next book. So the idea of a body of work or lifetime achievement is, 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 is a sort of new concept. I'll have to go home and ponder on that for a while um, over the Christmas season. But um, in the meantime, I just need to express my gratitude to you all for coming, my gratitude to the Cohen family for coming, 
and for David Cohen for being so nice that night in 1993, uh, which seems so near and so far. And um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Clarissa became a determined champion of authors' rights during her years as a literary agent with A.P. Watt. She used to sit up all night reading the works of young writers and poets. Finally, in 1995, she got what for her was a dream job at the Arts Council. And she believed that the public purse could and should make good writing as widely available as possible. Nothing could ever restrain her idealism and enthusiasm and excitement. At home, she was always the one who made Christmas sparkle. And at work, she came up with a series of imaginative and inspirational ideas to promote new writing and literary magazines and independent press publications. Clarissa had just been promoted to senior literary officer at the Arts Council when after the return of her cancer, she died in 1999. And the aim of this prize set up by the Arts Council and later taken on by New Writing North is to ensure that her support for writers, especially young writers, is properly remembered and recognized. And now we get to give the sister award, so I'm going to let Colm introduce who, who is to receive this. Um, this was easy. There's a, there's a young poet um, in Belfast whose work I admire and whose first book, who's published two chapbooks, um, or poetry pamphlets, whose first full book is coming out from Carcanet next month. And uh, so I would like to present this prize uh, to Corrie Regan. Corrie. Thank you, thank you. Um, I do just want to say thank you, Colin. Thank you so deeply. Thank you. So three decades ago, both my parents started this prize, and I'm so proud of them both. I'm grateful, grateful that the prize exists, and also grateful to the long line of writers who have accepted this prize as a prize worth accepting. And I have to say, I also feel personally blessed to have been allowed to sit in on so many judging sessions, or as my parents used to call them, free tutorials in English Lit. So thank you, Hermione and team, for this year's free tutorials. But to get back to the point, three decades ago, my parents put the funding for this prize in place, which means that the privilege, yes, privilege, of being able to fund it today came to us, the second generation of funders on a plate. And I always think, if you've had some luck in life, if something great is just handed to you on a plate, the least you can do is try not to drop it. Which is why we, the trustees, Gillian Barker, my dad's beloved second wife, Olivia, my sister, and me, we, the trustees, we promise to preserve the funds that are, to keep the prize that is, this prize, so that we can all continue to honor lifetimes of literary achievement. So if you have any drink left in your glasses, I invite you to raise your glass to this great literary achievement and also to many years of literary achievement to come. Thank you all very much for you know, daring to venture out this evening despite all the obstacles. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you.